Okay, uh, also welcome from my side. For those of you who haven't seen me yet, I guess you haven't been here regularly <laughs> in the last <laughs> months. Uh, my name is Carsten Thelman, I work for GData and we are supporting this course, um, which basically means we offer an additional evening event. Um, this will also take place uh, next time, but uh, if you don't plan to join the course next time because you are not interested anymore or have other studies which are more important, which should not exist, but still, um, <laughs> we, of course we, we offer this event uh, next term as well. But if you'd like to join us today, we offer a really nice food and a cozy atmosphere with free drinks and everything. So if you're interested in joining us to talk a little bit more in detail about the topics Sven is presenting today, or if you want to get in touch with people working in the antivirus industry, especially the technical people, um, all of you are welcome to join us later. Here you can see some uh, facts, but if you are interested and want to know more about everything, don't hesitate to come to me after the talk and I'm, I can explain in a little bit more detail what everything is about. So, uh, now Sven is starting and i uh, like to hear a warm welcome from you, please. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for the nice introduction. Um, so, I talk today about penetration testing in a modern world. Um, I would like to provide you some insights how we develop penetration tests, um, different services, how we, how we start them, where they end, what we can do for clients, what we cannot do for clients. Um, and how all that connects together. I put in a little bit about bug bounties as well, because I know that students might love bug bounties to, to get some more money um, from, from public things um, that are available. Um, and I, I try to, to, to compare pen testing a little bit with bug bounties and how they fit um, um, against each other. Okay, who I am? Uh, a little bit was already done on the introduction side. Um, I'm head of assurance, which is pretty much, I'm, I'm leading the pen testing team in Germany. Uh, we are about uh, 15 people in Germany now, um, and 150 um, for the whole company. Um, we have offices uh, in Australia, in UK, and in Germany. Uh, we separate ourselves in uh, three sections. That's um, assurance, where I work. It's uh, research and response. So response is a typical forensic, um, attack detection style of things. Research is what you might know from the university as well, um, where you look specifically into one product, find vulnerabilities in that, um, you might have seen the XML research done um, by James Forshaw when he worked for us. Things like that is everything under, under research. Um, assurance is everything else. It's pen testing, it's review of configurations and operating systems. Um, the important bit here is that I um, that, that, that we don't sell any product. So we don't have any vendors that support us. Um, we, we just go for the, uh, for the vulnerabilities themselves. What we will discuss today um, is the life of a penetration test. It's a little bit theoretical. I will guide you through um, a project plan, how we build them up. It's, um, it's not that entertaining, but important to keep things together in the end, and also to bridge over to the uh, pen test versus bug bounties. Um, part of the presentation um, where I try to compare those. It will get technical when I show three different um, practical examples. I can't show you, of course, what I found in the field because that's from the client and we're not allowed to show that. Um, but I um, rebuilded a few things to make up the, the vulnerabilities that, that I've discovered. Um, so it's pretty much the same vulnerability just on a custom developed application. Okay, um, so what's a penetration test? Is, is anyone here, I see it's a very uh, packed room, <laughs> which is good to see. Anyone who's very familiar with penetration tests, you do that right next to the study already. Okay, 
Okay. So, but penetration testing itself, I guess, because there are so many people here now, um, that's already something um, to recognize. So, um, what is a penetration test and why different services exist? Um, a long time ago, penetration test was always like a client comes up and says, I would like that you check this part. Um, on the network and you will perform a penetration tests. You used Nmap, you used some scanning systems, you used some public exploits, some private exploits, um, if, if required. Um, today's penetration testing is much more focused, um, I, I believe. So you're concentrating much more on services. You, you look at um, different services like like web application, some parts of a web application. If you have a very big application, you wouldn't say I do a penetration test on Amazon, for example. Um, you would say I take a look on a module from Amazon, like I look what the session is doing. I take a look on the checkout from Amazon, how the process works and that, that sort of things. And that goes into life cycle um, at the vendor again. So what does it look like when it comes up to, to us? I will just open those. Um, so when, when, we start, when we start a project, a client typically contacts us and asks us, we have a, we have a problem, problem here or we have some difficulties we need, we need to check and that's a very important bit. Um, why is the client coming up and wants a penetration test? Um, often it is because the client has a requirement, either from a third party, they sell a product to someone and they say, before we buy the product, we need to see that you have done a penetration test and, and all that. That all comes in, in the first contact where we try to, to find out what the drive is behind, um, behind this contact. Then it goes to the sco uh, scoping, which means um, we, we try to um, collate all the information that is, that is available. We might ask for more information, um, and then we, uh, then we provide an estimate what we think how long it takes to test that. So there's much more involved, like it might be that we say that test you try to think of isn't the one that you really like to, to see. There's a lot of Vulnerability assessments, uh, where people say, uh, sell vulnerability assessments like automated things where you click a button and they sell that as a penetration test. Say, we write the report and it finds vulnerabilities, so that's, that's not the thing, but um, at that point it's, it's the honest part to the client where you need to, to discuss with them what's really behind um, the test. So tendering is then, um, uh, where the proposal goes to the client, uh, so the client can check that and it might come back and they say, no, that's not the right thing. Um, we need something different or more focus on that little bit. Um, scheduling is that part from us again, where we try to schedule the resources that we need. Sometimes you need special hardware um, for, for some tests or sometimes you need special people for the project because it's a uh, special knowledge required. Um, all these parts are non-technical at um, when, when we work on them. It's a little involvement in the scoping um, where we are, uh, but the technical consultant is, is really then active at the consultancy and in the, in the QA phase. So consultancy is when you perform the penetration test and QA is um, um, after you've done a report, um, the, the quality assurance that you look and uh, see that the technical findings are all correct and all good, uh, good written up. After that, it goes back to the project delivery and it might come back if the client is unhappy with um, the one or the other wording. Um, and of course, the findings that you've got, it doesn't end there. You might need to do a retest on that. So it might come up again that um, the client says, okay, I fixed, I fixed all the vulnerabilities um, that, that you have discovered. Could you please take, um, take a look that, that they are closed now? So the whole process starts again down. That's in a nutshell um, how we do a project when it comes to uh, penetration testing. Okay, um, let's... Let's go back to, or quickly go through the um, 
theoretical bit of that. We will take a look at consultancy and QA now a little bit more um, to, to say what it is. Um, in the consultancy, you typically check for the requirements. Um, what you did, you do the consultancy, you find a project lead. So you need to find someone who's um, leading the project. So you often have a, pen have a penetration test uh, where three, four, five people are involved. And um, someone needs to manage them and explain. Not everyone just goes onto an application or a network and just tries to hack the shit out of it. It's just you need to organize the people a little bit um, to tell them where to focus on um, and, and what to do. So that's, that's part of the project lead. Um, on, on the requirements, that's a little bit more for, for the client. So the client needs to provide us with data. So we make, in the, in the project phase, we make requirements and tell the client when we need to test a web application for you, we need, um, we need the UL, obviously. Um, do you have user accounts? Do you have user roles? How many user roles do you have? We need two users for each user role you test so that we can test the authorization between those user roles and also for, for upper roles. <coughs> um, not only that, and that's all experience. So you, you've got all that, you log into the application and you see an empty application. So there's no data. <laughs> and if there's no data, there is nothing you can really test because if you always see an empty page, it's very difficult. It, you might find something, but it, it works much, much better if you have data in the application. So that's all part of the requirement. So the, the whole penetration testing, what it sounds like, is a much more complicated job than just this pure technical bit, what we all enjoy that very much. Uh, same for the, for the QA. Um, when you do the report writing, uh, every penetration testing company has some templating system. We, we are not different on that. So when you have a cross-site scripting um, issue on, on your application, we don't write that up from zero. It's, uh, it's in the template, you click a button, you fill out the, the placeholder, and it's in there. And it's there for a reason, um, because the quality assurance is so important that when you have bigger clients where you do penetration test after penetration test after penetration test, um, you don't want them to have in each single report a different description for cross-site scripting. You want to have it consistent um, in the same way. Um, and to achieve that, you usually do um, try to, um, to use, use a templating engine. Uh, on top of that, you use, use other QAs. Uh, we do a technical QA where we see does it even make sense what the consultant is um, writing there? Does it fit to the whole project? Does he have anything forgotten maybe, which is in the proposal, um, but just got slipped away? We are all humans, it's, it's possible. Uh, presentation QA is more style and grammar. I promise I will make that quick. <laughs> um, but. When you, when you come up to, to reporting, you need, you need to uh, define the impact. You need to find a risk. I, I hate it to define a risk for an application because there's much more involved in the risk um, than just the technical issues that you've discovered. It's probably different if you have cross-site scripting on online banking than it is on, don't know, pet your dog or website. It's, um, but still, we would rate it probably the same because we shouldn't make a difference. This risk assessment is with the client. They need to consider, is cross-site scripting something that important to me to take the application down um, and patch it immediately or not? Uh, one way to do that or one way to, to verify if uh, that is required or not to, to match a little bit on the risk is CVSS. Uh, the common vulnerability scoring system in version 2. So you can click a little bit around and can say uh, what your access vector is, if it is on the network, complexity, if you are authenticated or not. In the end, there's a number, and the number is assigned to um, a severity, which, is, which can go from low to medium to high, um, etc. Um, that's possible. It's 
some, sometimes difficult to say uh, when you do scenario-based testing, so modern penetration testing, where you look into specific parts um, of, of an application or a network and look, look at that, then it might not be easy to, um, um, to, to clarify or to, um, to check on, on those met metrics. Uh, that's one reason why we choose a much more simple approach. <laughs> Um, that's German now, but uh, whatever, it's, uh, I think the, the colors are uh, self-explaining. Uh, we, we just wait on the impact and on the difficulty by default. So we just say we know the impact of a SQL injection probably is whatever, and we can say um, how difficult it is to exploit from our experience and also from what is given. Is it an administrator account? Um, where only three administrators exist, and um, uh, it's probably pretty difficult when you task from the perspective of a normal user. So, almost last slide for, for reporting and procedures. Um, that's, that's how it looks like then in the end. Uh, so, when you, when you use a templating engine <laughs> and say, I found a SQL injection, um, you then start up um, inserting your, your things which, which are custom, like you say it's Microsoft SQL, uh, SQL um, Server. In the appendix, you would put some more technical parts where you say, like, what did the injection look like really in the end? And what data could you extract? Um, so that's more a little bit high level overview. Uh, overview. Um, good. So to compare that, what we, what we found in the last three years, um, so that you have an idea about uh, from, from our waiting, um, how, that, how that fits in. Um, uh, we have an average of eight to 10 issues per, per report, and one to, to one, uh, or Every second report, we find an, an issue which is which has a high or higher impact and is easy to exploit. Um, I think that's the, the, the best bit. And um, on the right side, you can see um, how that compares to the total amount of issues found. So on bug bounties, uh, you usually have have a scope on bug bounties when you do um, some rules that you that you need to follow. They tell you. Don't submit um, session cookie, HTTP only is missing, and those kind of things, because they're simply not interested in it. On a penetration test, it's important that we make, uh, make a full picture of the application. Um, and that's why we probably have always 50% of low impact issues, because we need to report everything from you leak your HTTP banner here, and your session cookie is, has those flags hat or not. Um, so that's, um, that's the reason here. Okay, let's try to make a bridge to the, uh, to the bug bounties um, and how, how that compares. Um, that's uh, an issue submitted to, to Bugzilla. Um, the also hoped to, to get a bounty, I guess, uh, because he found that the Mozilla source code was leaked on the, on the internet um, and obviously got the response like, no, that's, that's what we do, we, say, we, we are open source. It shows one difficulty from, from bug bounties. They're really difficult um, to deal with because you, you can't say you don't start working on bug bounties for us anymore. Um, but we want to see more from you. You, you have to be lucky to get the good guys um, on, on, on your product and, and look at your security, but you can also get things like that. They are, that that's the worst example. There are good examples, like that was also a bug bounty that James Forshaw won. Uh, from, from Microsoft, he, he found a mitigation bypass, as Microsoft calls that, for, for, for their bounty. Um, and I think he was the first one who, who got a $100,000 bounty um, on that single issue that he found. So, 
it's both good. Let's compare them in a table, because we, we love tables. Um, you, you can't say, as, as, as the pictures in the beginning now showed, uh, for, for bug bounties, you can't say it's either that way or that way. There are good bug bounties, there are bad pen tests, but in usual, from my experience, as I do bug bounties in private and pen tests for, for living, um, that's that, that's how it is. When when I do when I do a bug bounty, it's usually a quick win. I, I look at certain applications. I see who's coming up on bug bounties, and um, um, I take I take a quick look at the application to find something nice to uh, get some money to to spend on my next verb license, as an as an example. Um, thing, things like that. Uh, the range is one of the most important things. You got lots of opinions on, on the bug bounty. That's why the, the rules they put in place are growing and growing and growing. Um, they're getting more and more and more uh, because they, they don't want to see that many submissions. And they also tr try to limit um, the bounty submission so that they say, don't do any automated testing, don't do that, don't do that. It's very difficult to achieve what you would do on a normal penetration test on a bug bounty because of all those limitations uh, you've got. A specific example is Yahoo. Oh yeah, forgot about that. That's uh, pretty much a picture for what you, what I think is a pen test and what a bug bounty is. But, <laughs> um, so when we come to, to Yahoo, Yahoo is a little bit, was a little bit. They, they just updated their guidelines uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, that's those, those the old ones. Um, it's a little bit like they try to explain the, the bug hunters. Um, they pet them as a baby. They say, you know, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Don't touch here, don't, not here, no, nope. here as well not. Um, so things like uh, any vulnerabilities found through automated tools or scans um, will, will not be looked at or will, will fall out of, of that. The difficulty is when you do a penetration test, you do automated stuff because you want to do that. You want to have it um, uh, in, in a way that you control it. You don't want to have it automatically telling you there's a SQL injection, but you want to tell it, please do those things, and I know when you come back with that, it's a SQL injection. That's what you really want to do, because you, you don't test an application just via a browser. You need to have tools to do automated submissions and all that. They pretty much don't want that. Um, what you get when you don't follow the rules with Yahoo is that. Um, and that's, that's my experience with, with Yahoo. They, they start blocking your, your IP from accessing all Yahoo systems just because you, you did what we would consider a normal penetration test, really. Good. Um, I went through a little bit quicker than, than I thought. That was the first half of the uh, presentation, the theoretical bit. Um, so. I will show some examples that could match to that next. So these are the practical bits that I prepared. So the, um, the, the notes from the fields, as we call it, um, things that are not the standard pen test that you find or might have become standard, like the multi-step fuzzing is something I've, I've seen for two years now more and more, and it's really annoying to test. You will see why. Um, first of all will be a capture solver. I think that's straightforward. Everyone knows what a capture is. Um, so maybe let's jump into that. Mm. First of all, to play, yep. I will just show you the application that you know what it is. If we built that in, in the real world, it was an application, I think a comment form or something where you need to enter a capture, and I needed to test it that in an automated way. So here you can see um, the, the challenge. I, I, I built that for, for CTF. 
um, the challenge was to count up to 1,000. So every time you hit the button, it does plus one. If you do more than five, it presents you a capture and tells you, no, you need to solve the capture, otherwise you're flooding, flooding my system. If you enter the right capture, you're getting plus one. If you don't get the right capture, you're starting at zero again. Um, so you need, need to start from the beginning. Um, let's see if you can hear that. That's the capture. Five got everyone, right? <laughs> um, so sometimes it's a little bit difficult. You need to normalize the, um, the sound file. So I use the sound here because it's usually way easier than, than any picture you would, you would start analyzing. Um, I, I st uh, use the Wi-Fi. Normally you would uh, normalize it to reduce the noise, put the noise out to make it really basic to have that what it is. If it's getting louder um, in, or more noisier in, in, in the background, you would start removing it, bring it all to one level so it's all equal. Here it's of course a very easy example. Um, so that's all all done, um, and the Zox command I, I showed here is just there that splits the one WAV file you can see up there uh, into six WAV files, which all show, uh, which all contains the single character that was pronounced here. Let's take that in the middle, or oh, our five in the end. So it works. We we can start building our base. Um, with that, um, I created a Python script to load. So first of all, I used all the captures um, that are available and tried to get A to Z, zero to nine, so that I have everything available. I split it up everything. I named them A.wave, B.wave, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and then wrote a, a Python script. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a good developer, so don't, don't laugh at my code. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I I built um, a capture solver which is doing pretty much exactly that. It takes the, the file name um, that that we gave it a dot wave. It's um, processing the Zox command that we have. So every time um, you 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 give it a wave file, it starts splitting them up. That's what we want to solve. And in the background, it has an array where it knows a dot wave. And that is the content of a dot wave, and it is made very easy um, for us. Oh yeah, one one important bit is if you have wave files, um, it's it's get crazy easy because uh, they are so easy to compare. Um, I don't load in the full wave file, um, the full length of the wave file, uh, because it speeds up things if we if we don't have to process that much data. Um, so the main bit is done in line 16 to 22. Um, that's where I just read the file, I put it in an array. Um, it's unsorted, so it's just there to be processed later. And that's later. <laughs> um, line 33 to 40 uh, are just there to make the array sorted, um, to to check for, for, for certain bits, um, and then just start looping through through my created array, what I, what I had before. Um, so line 42 is doing, I wouldn't call it magic, but it's, it's doing what we want. Uh, 42 just compares in Python if that content is in that content. So you can do um, like a small, um, smaller wave file that you have from from your base, um, and a bigger wave uh, from from your actual capture, and then you just say, "Is that in there?" And if you're lucky, it is. When it gets more complicated, that's the other part of the code where you have the uh, sequence matcher, uh, which will make make a diff on it, and um, try to find a, a ratio uh, to say if it's 
likely 60% of that content consider it is. And it works pretty, pretty well with that. As you can see, and does it work? Yeah, in that example. So it's 1,000. We've got some time to, to do now. Any stories? Anyone? No? OK. No, obviously. So, easy as it hopefully worked. I know it worked. So, sorry for that. Spoiler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry, wasn't updating here. Yeah, so that was part of the CTF we did in the beginning of the year, or at the beginning of the year. Um, that's, that's why there is a token. In the real world, it was, as I said, I think it was a comment form which I need, needed to fuss. So I configured my, my proxy. We, we are using Burp um, on application tests usually. Um, I can configure Burp to do all the work for me. So I could submit it and in the background it was solving the captures for me and providing the value to, uh, to Burp back again. Um, so it's just a small snippet from a bigger project. Good. So uh, the next example is DNS Watch. Um, that's that's more different. It goes more into the uh, research area um, from from context. Um, also, it's very simple. It's very effective. So we've got it in place for a few years now, and um, we used it for so many things. <laughs> Uh, it's incredible. We didn't even thought in the beginning when we created it that we could use it for, for such a thing. I assume everyone knows what DNS is and how DNS works. Was Dan Kaminsky here? <laughs> Ever? Gave a talk? No? Okay. Um, good. Then, then I need to say what DNS is probably. No. Um, just imagine the, the yellow part, the target, um, is is a client network, and it's a secured client network. It's so secure, the target doesn't even have a gateway set. So it can only communicate within its own network. In the same network, there's a target name server, um, the, the client name server, which is our target name server. So when our target tries to look up a DNS, it will query the target name server. The target name server doesn't know what to do with it. Um, because it doesn't know the name. So it will, if configured, go out to the internet and see who's responsible for that. And who would know context is responsible for that? So the packet arrives at our network and says, what's the IP address behind that? Or what's the MX, whatever, what, what's your configuration? Um, and that's all we need to know. It's all we needed to know is to have from a network where, which is pretty secure, which doesn't have any connection to the outside, we need to get a packet out. There's the concept of a DNS tunnel, uh, which is not very new and all, all known. So it's all based on the same concept um, that you tunnel data throughout via DNS. Once again, awesome Python code. Yeah. Um, I, I, I created a CSV file which is uh, which contained a token, um, a username, and an email address. Um, that uh, that's what you can see on line three. Um, on line thirty-one, we initiated, so we start a sniffer um, in Python on on port fifty-three and say run into function find consultant. Uh, whenever whenever UDP packet on uh, part 53 arrives. Um, line 12, it's simple as that. That extracts the name out of the DNS packet. So the destined DST domain um, one, that's, uh, that was uh, what comes up for the for the domain name, um, and we go then through um, in lines 13 and 15, mm -hmm. and check that the DNS that is contained is in our pre-configured list, um, and loop through all the consultant in that list and see if we have a match or not. If we have a match, we send out an email to that consultant. So the consultant in in a practical world 
tests an application uses um, DNS tokens for injections. And whenever something tries to resolve that, the consultant gets an email to say, see, someone tried to resolve your, um, your DNS token. That allows you to find um, what uh, Portswigger, the, the burp creators, I think they named it super blind injections. Um, that's something when you, when you upload data to another system and it's processed there and you have injected something and it fails there. In, in the past, you always didn't have any chance to, um, to, to find that vulnerability because it, it broke and two weeks later, no one at that client side knew that that might be related to your test. Now you would know because now you get, um, you, you get an email and say two weeks later, hey, I just tried to resolve your, your name. Um, I, of course, made an example for that as well so that you know um, what it is. I created uh, a sample application which is doing some stats. It's not doing much really. <laughs> uh, I think I will show it later. It's just taking some, some log output from SSH on different systems and all that. Um, but that's not important. The important bit is it's processing input data later, not at the moment when I'm using the application. It's a con job in that, um, in that example that is created. So you can see I'm testing, testing a few bits if, if the page is static or not, if there's always the same content coming back or not. That's, that's a burp suite, this proxy tool we're using, by the way. Um, so I'm also adding um, some injections points and do, do an active scan for OS um, operating system command injections and let it scan that. So you will see it doesn't find anything. That's fair enough because it was static. It wasn't. It doesn't sleep when you do a command injection or anything because it's processing that in the background. So what you can see here is the injection list I used. The NS lookup with the fake token for Hekpra, and I used different techniques to break out of the code uh, out of the uh, the script that is called, um, and I inject that. And you see also there. No time delay. So usually, when our token would be uh, would be looked up, you would see a time delay um, because we don't respond with an IP, so it times out, and that usually takes a little bit of time. Um, so it wasn't triggered in the first view. Uh, I've saved all the requests in a log, of course, and. Dup, 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 dup. And the response is that. So the, the upper one is the email that you receive uh, when, when such a vulnerability is, is triggered. Um, you get an email from the script saying that your unique domain name was, was queried. Um, and you can see it's tried to query number 12 dot Sven, and I put the rest out. Um, and, you can, and then you can see in your logs or in your injections, wherever you prefer it, um, you can see what type of injection you just did and where it was. So you can identify, um, um, you, you can, can identify your injection later on as well. Uh, as I said, Burp Suite automated that process. You can use a system from them now or set up your own system. Um, so it tells you why you're testing that there, that there is a delay or delay or not, but it only works with this active scan, so the automated scan. As we love to do our manual testing, um, that's still our preferred way um, of, of testing, really. Okay, so the next one um, and last example is the, is the most complicated bit um, for this presentation. So. I hope I can, can run through it easily. I, I thought about using cats, but I thought, nope, bunnies are the next. Oh, no, they're not, right? Um, 
So once again, let's go through, through the application so that you've got an idea um, what it is. I just, is it running? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it's a process that you need to follow for that application. You know, you can build your bunny, you can give it different colors and different beards. Um, make it a hipster, give it a weight. And you create your, your wonderful bunny. Um, okay. Uh, below here, so you gave it a secret, so that's your group, um, pretty much. Um, so everyone in that group um, will will be in that area. I tried to resubmit that, so I tried to go back and just resubmit it to see if I get a new bunny um, in there immediately again with the previous defined values. It's the same here. I try I try to go back, and you see, nope, just nope. Um, it's not working. So yes, there's a token in it, which obviously everyone knows here. Um, it's a cross site request forgery token. So you can have a cross site request forgery, anti cross site request forgery token um, to prevent someone from repeating a request. But recent, or not that recently, um, you, you have tokens bound to certain actions on the application. So the application knows exactly that token belongs to the process um, basket checkout or updating um, updating um, values on on the application. So I, I try a common example to um, to bypass that is to get a fresh token from the beginning from the application. So that uh, we, we submit it again. That would be the case if they just check for the, for the token if it was used or not. Um, so that didn't work out. So in the end, as I created this app, I, I can tell you the only way is to run through the application from start to beginning. Otherwise, you can't create your bunny. So you need you have now the challenge that uh, you would like to test Builder 3. PHP, and you would like to see the beard if um, that is injectable or not. Um, so it's it's a third step, and there's a step after that as well that you need to do. So that's something uh, you you would might say it's a second order injection, um, which could be or something which is later injected. So you need to process it. Might not be injected before, but it processed only if you completed all steps. So. Um, that example should show you um, how you can configure burp in, in that example to test for those vulnerabilities. That's also something you can often find on bug bounties because everyone is too lazy um, to do that. It's, it's, it's not that complicated, but it's a little bit of a mess to set it up in the first. Um, first. Um, but once done, it works very easily, as you will see in a little little bit. Okay. Okay. The idea is that we create macros. Um, so we find which request we would like to test and record them in, in the proxy. That's what you can see down here. There. That's that's our first step. We go we go, we mark all the requests that we would like to take um, to be processed first. We give it a name, I just named it login because it's usually you have to do a login, at the, but whatever. Um, then there's a token and you need to say token from response number one, please put it in the request number two. That's what we do here. We give it the name token and we highlight that bit and it automatically knows, okay, in the future I always look into between those bits and I will tell you about the next one. There's, there's enough steps. <laughs> Here we mark it again. And you say token, take it from response number one. Oh, response two here. Yeah, you need to do that for all steps, really.
Okay. Yep. That's our login. Um, we leave the builder three out because builder three is that part that we would like to submit. So we get go. Yeah, that's the bit we want to submit. So we go to the next step. That's final. Final.php. I name it logout. There's nothing to define on that little little bit. So that were the macros um, where you say the action that should be performed. Um, in the session handling rule, you say when and in what order and what it should exactly do. So here you define a macro and say do a login and please update only the parameter token for me. And you also say, once you've done that, then my re request comes in, and there's a post macro as well, so that's something that always needs to be appended. Again, please update the token for us. Or I think for that one it wasn't required. A little bit difficult is that, uh, what do you want to pass back the latest, the last example, or the one from the builder number three? You might want to test for both, both is valid. Um, in our example, we, we want the last response. Okay, here we define the scope only from the application. We say, just trigger that when you see builder3.php, otherwise, um, don't, don't go on here. Okay. We put it up in the session handling rule, so all the cookie things are automatically han handled already for us. And now I just verify that it works, so if we repeat the request now, we come to the last page and see the last page response and edit another value. So. That worked. Good. So, that was the most complicated bit, by the way, <laughs> um, to get that set up. I know it's a little bit cut at the, on, on the side, um, but you should be able to see everything. I hope you can see it on the back as well. Um, otherwise, I will guide you through it. Um, so once, once we configured it, we want to, to test it, of course. Um, a standard, standard test is obviously always to use this active scan from Burp. Also, we love to do the manual testing. It's there, so why don't use it sometimes or much more often now? <laughs> it finds some, some, some good stuff even. And while you do your manual testing, it already runs in the background. The important bit is to, to say it's all, uh, it should all only run on one thread because all the processing that needs to be done, you don't want to have it running in parallel because the session gets confused and you don't want that. In this example, we only looked for, for SQL injections. I know I, I spoiled that again what might be, might be the issue here. It also takes a while. Um, I put in two burp proxies, so don't, don't get confused here. Um, on, on the right side, it's uh, where I do the active scan, on, and the right side is tunneled through the left side, so that's a proxy chain I put in. It's much easier to test than um, that sort of things. And you can see it's delaying already quite a lot here um, because there was a sleep 20 injected, so it's probably waiting for 20 seconds. As you can see on the right side, it discovered something. Red is always good for us. Um, so in that instance, an automated test even found the SQL injection, which wouldn't have been found by any other automated test. That's the, the important bit to see here, um, because it didn't know where to take the token um, and how to process the order. Uh, so you needed to say it to, to find that. But then you could start testing it even automatically. OK, the, the last part um, will be 
it's, it's not a technical challenge really. So everyone will know now how that works, but of course we need to bring that to an end. Um, so once we know that there is a SQL injection, we want to exploit it. So once again, you always want to test, is it a static page, is it coming back with the same results or not? Um, here you can see single quote comes back with, with nothing, which is a good thing. Um, here I try to comment out the rest of the query, of the SQL query in the background with two dashes. Um, it's still not coming back with, with anything. We know it compares things, so it's very likely to be a like statement on a select. So I included a percent here. Um, and now I just tried to break out of the whole SQL statement. And here you can see that's what required to break out of the SQL statement. You can see that that data is returned on that. And always remember in the back it's processing the whole steps every time again from start to beginning to end. And does our little bit in the, um, in the middle. Uh, so I try to figure out the columns here, but as you all did the HECPA, I'm pretty sure you know how to do that, right? <laughs> so, no, I, I don't spoil how, how many there are. It's may, may, maybe 50? <laughs> I, I've got time. <laughs> So we had seven columns, that's why data is returned. The challenge was to find a secret bunny. There's still only the Christian B in it. Still no secret bunny. Um, so it must be somewhere in the database. Uh, I, I do the usual lookups here um, to, to find out what the table name is. And, oh, sorry, first of all, the version, of course, to see that we have some some uh, string where, where we can uh, respond with the data. Um, yeah, now no, no we go for the information schema and look for the tables. So that's all the table names. And we see it's bunnies. Who would have thought that? It's bunnies. Um, so it's only to find the columns. I might have should, should done that as a practical thing here, right? Uh, next time. <laughs> so, do we have the columns already? Uh, I'm very slow in typing. <laughs> yes, there we go. So it's name, eyes, beard. And there's a secret in it as well. So we have all the information we require. We probably need name, we need secret, and we want to request those information um, from bunnies. Yeah. And that should return all the data to us. Yeah, there's much more. And there's a secret bunny with the, with the token as well. So I, I created a little CTF style of, of game around it again um, to make that available internal for us um, so that people can start playing with it and understand how the processing works uh, for different injection methods. Uh, but that's pretty much it. So uh, it's, it's simple as that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the life of penetration testing, which was the beginning, which uh, showed you how, how we do penetration testing. Um, I tried to compare that to the bug bounties and I hopefully showed you some more interesting and exciting examples from the field that we discovered um, and found and are used now practical on almost every test. So yeah, that's it. Questions?